So I wanted to uh, do a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll start with the objectives, what we wanted to do with uh, ISSU, uh, go over what was delivered in the Loon release, look at the limitations of uh, what was done there, and then start looking at um, a new protocol that was proposed uh, on how to overcome these limitations, and then we can discuss uh, how it actually overcomes its limitations, and then look at the timeline for when we will be getting this functionality. The Loon release. The Loon release was uh, our recent release, which was the uh, 1.11 release. Um, so the objective for ISSU, or in-service software upgrade, um, is for us to be able to upgrade the owner's core and applications without interrupting service. So the focus of the Loon release was around building some foundational pieces so that we are able to um, upgrade the cluster. All right? So what we want to be able to do is, in order to not impact services, the cluster has to be upgraded in place, which means what we want to do is be able to take down individual nodes, uh, upgrade it, bring it back up, um, and then have the uh, state um, be able to, uh, have the nodes be able to communicate each other to you know, preserve uh, consensus. Um, so what we want to be able to do is have these doors be able to communicate with each other um, and be able to uh, persist data across version. So backwards compatibility becomes very critical um, as we look at this. So what was done to support that? Um, so Cryo was uh, updated, so we ended up using a compatible serialization, which was uh, the compatible field serializer. Uh, a property was added, so what we do is we actually ship ISSU uh, not enabled by default uh, in Loon. So what you have to do is you have to uh, enable this uh, property, and it allows us to default the serializer to the compatible field serializer. What that means is when you go from uh, one version of the node to the other, it's able to actually recognize the uh, names of the fields and be able to allow you to uh, remove and add uh, additional fields as you go from one version to the next. Other things that we did was refactor uh, the primitive storage. Um, so for example, graph protocol logs, I refactored them to support cryo serialization. Before they were using custom serialization mechanism. Um, so this allows us to uh, have a uh, whole support cryo serialization. Um, we also added versioning to the RAF logs and other config files um, to support backwards compatibility. So limitations. Um, as we look at what was delivered in Loon, um, there are uh, some challenges, right? So if you look at uh, upgrade as a whole, there's the underlying serialization, but as you move up the stack, there's uh, the core, there's applications. With the core, what you end up having is you have a bunch of stores. Uh, the stores use various distri distributed primitives. Um, what can happen is you can have uh, the store updated so that it uses a different primitive. So how do you go from one version of the primitive to another as you have different uh, versions of the nodes? What you need to be able to do is have the core be able to replicate the state in a different uh, format, essentially. Um, so that was not supported in Loon. Uh, what other challenges you have would be around applications. As you move from one version of an application to another version of an application, uh, the logic in the application can change. So how do you handle a, a situation where uh, one application decides that, for example, the flows it's going to push um, will change, right, as it moves to a different version of the application. So uh, other uh, challenges are around uh, no mechanism to prevent incompatible upgrades. Um, as you heard earlier, we were looking at semantic versioning. So one option we can look at is use semantic version to actually identify uh, compatibility versus incompatibility. Um, and then we also have no mechanism to uh, roll back a field upgrade, uh, which is critical to make sure that the system functions as a whole. So um, these are the requirements we have, right? As we look at the challenges, the requirements are to be able to isolate um, the store, application state, and communication across versions um, to support um, migrating the state uh, as it goes from one version to another, be able to provide um, automatic uh, rollback, be able to uh, preserve fault tolerance. I mean, what you want in terms of clustering is be able to um, tolerate faults as uh, partitions happen on the network, for example. So this is the ISSU protocol. Um, it was recently proposed by Jordan um, and um, reviewed with the TST. So we'll do an overview of the protocol. Um, and then if you have any questions or you know, improvements that you want to suggest, feel free to join the brigade. 
uh, and help us work on it. So uh, ISSU. The first step in ISSU is actually to uh, run a series of commands. The first command is called ISSU init. ISSU init sets the storage to read only mode. Um, this allows uh, us to be able to preserve uh, the state of the old nodes. Um, as you move to the second stage, um, you start off by upgrading a minority of the uh, nodes in the cluster. Uh, what this allows you to do, since you're upgrading only a minority of the nodes, your older cluster members are still there to preserve uh, your consensus. Uh, the master chip is reassigned to the old nodes um, so that they're able to still function. Um, and then you uh, upgrade uh, your minority of nodes. Um, and then the upgraded nodes are actually initialized with a snapshot of the state of the old nodes. This way, the state is isolated between your old version and new version. And I'll go into a bit more details how it's doing that later. Uh, the next step is to run the ISSU upgrade command. Um, this actually switches mastership from the old nodes to the new nodes. Um, this way, now you've got a system set up so that you actually have your devices communicating um, to the upgraded nodes. And then you verify the upgrade. Um, the proposal at this point is you verify it manually. Um, we're looking at an option of partially automating this in the future to make sure that you can do a fully automated upgrade. And then once you've verified um, that the state is uh, what you need and in terms of the core, in terms of the applications, um, you can then move to committing the upgrade. Uh, what this means is mastership is now right with all the new nodes. It'll rebalance that. And then your old state is purged from the system. And that means no uh, rolling back to the old version. So rolling back to uh, a failed upgrade. Um, so uh, if your verification fails, what you do is you issue or an ISSU rollback command. Uh, what this command does is it changes the mastership um, back to the old nodes. Um, so then your devices uh, uh, end up with the old state, and then you remove the, um, the uh, locks on the devices, right? So then it goes back to the old state where it can uh, uh, participate in changes in events in the network and continue to function um, as previously. Upgrade Manager. The Upgrade Manager is a component that we'll be introducing to the system. Uh, this component is going to coordinate uh, the upgrade of the cluster. Uh, so all the commands that we've talked about before, it'll be available through this component. Um, it's an in-process service um, that runs locally on each of the nodes, um, and it uses consistent primitives. Um, and these primitives are actually backed by a partition that spans the cluster. So overcoming limitations. So we talked about a series of limitations. Um, so how does this protocol or proposed protocol um, provide or overcome these limitations? So isolation. Uh, the way we're isolating communication uh, of the, uh, between the new version and the old is uh, when the new nodes come up, uh, we actually copy and fork the partitions that were on the old nodes. This gives us the flexibility to be able to preserve the state of the old nodes so that we can roll back to it, but it also allows us to be able to change the state as we move forward with the new nodes. Um, so what happens is the new nodes create versioned um, back partitions, and then from the snapshots of the old one. Um, so communication is isolated because what happens is when you look at the cluster configuration for the, um, the cluster, the version cluster, the members can only see each other based upon the version uh, that they're associated with. Um, and of course, the read-only mode uh, makes sure that your old uh, cluster, uh, their state is not changed, so you don't have a, a split brain situation. So state migration. Uh, by doing this, what this allows us to do is we're able to modify the state of the upgraded nodes without impacting the state of the old nodes, right? Which allows us to be able to roll back to it. Um, so what happens is uh, as your applications and the, your core comes back up from the upgrade, it's able to initialize itself from the snapshot of the old state, and then after that be able to uh, make changes to it. Um, it reduces the complexity uh, of managing the offline upgrades. So um, rollbacks. 
by preserving the state, the old state, we're able to roll back to it. So what you want to make sure is, if there is even one version that has the old state, we're able to uh, use that and then roll back the rest of the uh, nodes to that. Um, what we use is the master shift change, right? So if you have a failed state, you can actually uh, put your devices to old devices based on a master shift change, and then it's able to pick up the uh, old state and be able to revert back to that. Um, and then uh, there are different ways of actually upgrading a cluster. You can create a whole new cluster, upgrade it, and then point all your devices to it. But the impact there is now you have to reconfigure all your devices. By being able to upgrade a cluster in place, you're pre able to preserve the services that are running on it. Fault tolerance. Um, how do we manage fault tolerance? The way we're managing fault tolerance is that um, as you go from the old nodes to the new nodes, the new nodes are actually uh, participating as non-voting members um, in the, uh, the consensus protocol. So what happens is they're actually part of the cluster um, still, and what you're able to do is you're able to participate in consensus and have the same fault tolerance because all the nodes are still there. So the concern with uh, reducing your cluster sizes as you're upgrading is you are fluctuating um, how many nodes are in your uh, cluster, which impacts your ability and your uh, fault tolerance. And so what we want to do is we're preserving the full set of cluster members in the old state so that you can go back to it um, and be able to tolerate the same number of faults as you had previously had. Uh, the gotcha is, of course, as we look at uh, the new upgraded nodes, we cannot preserve this guarantee. So with the new nodes, what happens is uh, if there is a fault there, we will roll it back. Um, so it will go back to the old state. Timeline. So as we look at this proposal and uh, changes, um, what we're looking at is in the loom release, we had talked about what was delivered and it was the foundational work to uh, enable this to happen. Um, so if you look at the functionality that was in Loon, treat it as experimental. Uh, we recently released Loon 1.11.0, um, 1.11.1. You can actually upgrade between the two uh, with some caveats. Um, you'll need to manually upgrade the applications. Um, there are some state changes there that we're working through as a part of the new protocol. In MacPy, this is our upcoming release. We're going to be working through the new protocol. Uh, we're adding the upgrade manager and supporting the commands. Um, we'll sort of support mastership-based upgrades, uh, state isolation. But for fault tolerance, the automated rollbacks, uh, we're going to have to wait until the end release. SSU Brigade. So the first meeting is going to be next week, um, at least it's planned for next week. Um, so if you're interested, please visit the wiki um, and start participating in the Google group, uh, in the Slack channel, um, and attend the meetings. Um, it's a very interesting area, especially since it's so critical to deployment. So please contribute. Okay, that's all I've got. Uh, any questions, comments? And anyone have any comments about the ISSU feature and how it's going to be implemented? Can you come to the microphone there so we can hear you? Hi. Just a very small thing. Uh, you mentioned about master shift for devices. Will we move to new new version or old version? Uh, but what about the leadership and work partitions that we have in on us? Uh, so they will also be moved to the new version. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, we have uh, mastership for devices, right? And yes. there's one more thing, like leadership for applications, uh, the work partitions for us. So, so applications are leaders, leaders, leader nodes. Um, applications in owners have leader nodes, right? Yes. Leader nodes. Leaders. Leaders, leaders. Based on the So, are you referring to the device leadership or no, some other application leadership? Okay. The leadership uh, primitive itself, or the work partitions that we have. Okay, so based on the store, there are primitives that it's using, right? 
And so uh, what we're going to have to look at is, um, as we look at the upgrades, um, we're going to be dealing with multiple layers of upgrades. And so those are some of the things we're going to have to look at is, at an individual application level, are there changes that the applications have to take into account? Right? As they move from one version to another, they're going to have to have some intelligence to understand that there are changes in the version. Okay, uh, let's go to the person. Okay, thank you, Yeah.